Welcome to the Make Life Fun Show. I'm your host, Josie Wheatman, and I am so excited that you're here. I have graduated the mom game. I have been in it now for almost a year. Can you believe it? Everett is walking. Wow, it's a whole new game. Through the last 25 episodes, I have learned so much and I have grown in my craft. I have grown as a mom. And the biggest thing I've learned is just love, 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 taking it in, giving it out, love, and being in the present moment with my son and continuously just giving him my regulated self as often as I can. And that is what's changing the game in motherhood. That is what's breaking my generation of parenting. If you are new to listening, you are in for a treat. All right, friends, welcome back to the Make Life Fun podcast. I am so excited to have you back with us, and I'm so excited for you guys to meet Beth Miller. She is going to be talking to us today about our inner child and our marriage and all the goodness. I am so excited for this conversation, and Beth, welcome to the Make Life Fun Oh, thank you so much for having me. (laughs) Yes, please tell us a little bit about yourself. All right, so I'm Beth. I am a mom to three wonderfully crazy little men. They are six, eight, and 10. I've been married now 13 years. We just celebrated our anniversary on St. Patty's Day. And I am a marriage coach, a certified hypnotist, and I really help women who are really struggling within their marriages get to a place where they're happy again within their marriage and they no longer feel like angry, jealous, just triggered and resentful within their marriage. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's huge. And you have your hands full as well. (laughs) I do. Yes. Those men keep me busy. They are wild, but they're so much fun. Yes. Right. I would love for you to tell us a little bit about your journey as a mom and when it started out, what got you on this path of using the inner child and also using that as part of your mom journey and also as part of the marriage as well. Yeah, I didn't actually use it to start my mom journey, but it's actually helped me a ton with being a mom. What happened was I had a brain bleed, which is such a shocking thing. And sometimes it's even strange for me to say it out loud, but I had a brain bleed where I lost my ability to walk and it slowly happened over about five days. It was a slow bleed. My husband kept saying, maybe you just need to go see the doctor. I was like, maybe I need to go to physio because it was primarily in my right leg. And what happened was I ended up in a merge. They're like, your brain is bleeding. It was an ER, like Grey's Anatomy kind of a moment where I was like, am I going to live? I have three little men at home and I couldn't do anything. I spent a month in hospital and you know what it did is it just kind of wiped out my identity. I didn't know who I was anymore. I wasn't a mom. I couldn't work. I couldn't walk. I was a runner. I couldn't work out. And I went into a really deep depression and had some crazy anxiety about my brain bleeding again and losing my ability to walk. I've since recovered. So things are really good now. I can walk and I can run again. I always say it turned my life upside down, but now my life is right side up. Mm. I'm a better mom. I'm a better wife. I'm a better person. I love myself more. So Mm. that's what really started this whole journey of starting the inner child work and the Mm. shadow work. And it was by accident. I was just trying to get rid of my anxiety and depression. I tried a ton of different things and stumbled across a few that really helped. Yes. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. And I'm so happy that you've recovered and used that, well, roller coaster chaos into something so beautiful that you're helping people and changing lives with. That's just amazing. And I love that you're talking about the shadow and loving yourself. That piece is huge. The conversation on Make Life Fun is all about that big self-acceptance piece, which is so big, especially in motherhood and being a wife and in all things. So if you do not mind speaking a little bit on that self-love piece and what you found has worked for you personally, your clients and yeah. Yeah. So self-love, I didn't realize, but I didn't love myself in the beginning. I would say, yeah, yeah, I love myself. Of course, like ask yourself, just close your eyes and like, do I love myself? And you'll get an instant, like, you know what? I really do. I enjoy being with myself. I enjoy being alone. Things happen and I don't take it personally. I don't feel judged by others. Like that's when you really love yourself and you are in complete worth. You're confident and you know, you're deserving of everything you desire. But I wasn't in that place. I, I think I was a people pleaser. I got a lot of my validation from getting good grades, doing well in sports. And I liked other people's praise. When I got that, that filled me up. That made me feel like I was a good person. I relied so much on my external world that I didn't really love myself and work on my internal world. And so I think it's really important as a foundation to really learn to love yourself. And it's such a, like, do you love yourself? Like, how do you even know? And how do you even get there is a big question I often get. Yes, that one's a big one. So yeah, if you don't mind speaking 
on? How do you know and how do you get there? Yeah, often when you feel like ungrounded, you don't, you feel stuck in your life. That's often a really good indicator that you're not living authentically and authentic, like being your authentic you. What does that really mean? It really means like your badass version of you, like unleashing that and just being who you want to be. And so often society and beliefs get us really stuck and stuck thinking like I should go to college. I should stay in the same job. I shouldn't be arguing with my partner. I should be a better mom. And when you should yourself, you're guilt tripping yourself. You're telling yourself that you're not good enough. And so the first step really in this whole process is really recognizing your triggers Mm -hmm. anytime. And I say triggers are when someone's words or someone else's actions, or even your own words and actions makes you feel a certain way Mm -hmm. that you don't want to feel, whether that's anger, resentment, jealousy, sad, guilty, shame, Mm -hmm. embarrassment. So when those emotions come up, you're not going to celebrate, but essentially that's what you want to do. You're like, I'm triggered. That means there's something within me that needs attention. It's my body's way of speaking up saying, you know what? Things aren't in alignment right here. This isn't what I really want to do, or this is sucking my energy and making me exhausted. So when those things happen, that's when you really got to be like, okay, I got to go into this journey and figure out why am I really feeling this way instead of just stuffing it down. Because so often, especially as busy moms, we get mad at our kids for not putting on their socks. They come downstairs with a book instead, or we're late for work because they're still eating their breakfast or they're not listening. They're having a tantrum on the floor. And so often we don't deal with those emotions. And we just stuff them down and we're like, we got to get to work. And we almost project our anger onto others. Sometimes we take it out on our kids being like, you're going to make mommy late instead of just getting into your kids' shoes and realize what's really going on. Oh my gosh. Huge. When you were speaking on that, I felt like the energy because it's so true as moms, we are just going from one to the next and we feel so like high anxiety and we just got to do all the things. And we're just going to stuff that emotion down and we're not going to feel it. And we'll put it in the back burner to do later. And what happens is fire comes out because we now we have to deal with it because our emotions are in body is physically like out leashing it. And I would love to speak on that. What happens to us when we stuff it down? Oh, wow. Yeah. I think it's a really bad thing. And often what happens is over time. And I was there too. I started to get some anxiety after having my second kid. And I think there was like, I'd never had anxiety before, but I started to get a little bit of panic attacks here or there. Just life was just too busy. I was working as a teacher full time. I was trying to be super mom, trying to bake things that were healthy, trying to make healthy meals, trying to get them here, there and everywhere, make sure the house is clean. And I was burning out. I was getting enough sleep at that point. Yeah, my oldest was still not sleeping through the night. He was two when I was pregnant with my other and I was just so burnt out. And what happened was when you're not processing this stuff, you're not living authentically, you're trying to be super mom. What happens is you get those panic attacks and eventually can lead to like, a, often with women, it's emotional. So you can get some sort of breakdown or you go into anxiety and depression and you get mad at your husband a lot. You're resentful, you're angry, and you kind of blame others for why you're feeling that way. But really those emotions are yours. And that was a huge aha moment for me when I realized, you know what, every single emotion I have is actually mine. I can't blame my husband for making me feel mad because he's not maybe helping put the kids to bed the way I want to or he's going to play golf on a Sunday when really I feel jealous because I'm not hanging out with girlfriends. But a lot of that was mom guilt. I didn't want to leave my son for six hours. So there's so much that's going on there. That's really our own stuff, but we blame and then project onto others. And if we can get to a place where we feel those emotions and just stop and feel, even though we're so busy, we need to prioritize ourselves. Yes. Oh my gosh. Huge. That prioritizing yourself and taking that anger and lashing at your significant other, you don't even know that it's jealousy. You don't even know that it's resentment and that mom guilt too. It's so huge. And so I love that what you're saying is we have to recognize it. We have to acknowledge it and basically put a name to what we're feeling. And what I get a lot from my clients anyway, is I don't even know how I'm feeling. I just know that I don't feel good. And what do you say to that to that question? I just know I don't feel good. And so I just shove it down and I'll deal with it later because I don't even have a name for this feeling. Yeah, Josie, I'm glad you brought that up because you don't need to name it. You really don't. You just need to sense that your body's off. And in that moment, I would just take a moment and just close your eyes and close your eyes and take a deep breath in. When you take that deep breath in through your nose, just feel, does your breath get stuck anywhere in your body? And we can even do this right now. You just take a deep breath in. And if that breath goes all the way down to your belly, nice and smooth, things are good. But if sometimes I find with my clients, it gets stuck in your chest. 
all of a sudden it goes down. You're like, you know what? It doesn't get stuck, stuck, but there's like a tension there, a heaviness. And you can just place your hand, take your right hand and put it on your heart. Often it also gets stuck kind of in your upper belly, like under your ribs. And you feel, you feel a stuckness there. And so just sensing what is going on in your body in terms of your breath, does it feel like a heaviness? Does it feel like a denseness? Does it feel like stuck? Does it feel chaotic? Mm -hmm. And just seeing where we're holding those emotions in our body, because we really do hold our emotions in ourselves and in our body. And then just sensing where is it in my body and get curious and ask it, do I want to hold on to this anymore? Mm -hmm. And just breathe into it. And sometimes it sounds so silly, but if you can just use your visualization, like close your eyes, imagine like there's a door in your chest and it just like this beautiful door opens and you just see like whether it's black smoke or you just see this black like brick just leave or it float away or someone takes it away for you. And that's one strategy that some of the women I work with use is the visualization just to let it go and use your breath to let it go. And you don't even need to know why it's there. Sometimes it's good to figure it out, but often if you can just get yourself to a place of like, I can breathe again and it's not sitting on my chest like an elephant gosh, that is huge. That practice, it's huge. Our breath is so powerful and it brings us so much to the present moment. And that is where our power lies. Yeah, absolutely. Present moment. And one thing, like I can give you another little strategy, mm-hmm. like when you're out for a walk, so often we're like out with our girlfriends or if you're out with a stroller, just take the earphones out, stop listening to the podcast just for a tiny bit. I know we all need to binge watch your podcast or binge listen, but take it out and just listen what birds do you hear? What cars do you hear? Do you hear the tires of the stroller rolling on the ground? And when you do that, you're present, you're just listening. Like how many things can you hear? And it just slows you down. And when you're in, like you're out of your body at that point, like you're living your external, like you're out in present moment time, even though you're listening to external things, you're more out of your head, which you don't want to be in your head thinking about all the things you have to do. So just taking a few moments like that every day, and it doesn't necessarily have to be listening. It can even be looking like how many colors or shades of blue can Mm -hmm. I see in the sky? And just doing that for a moment will really ground you and make you feel like a better mom. Yeah. Wow. So true. And so powerful. And it's those little practices that once you start to do them and you ingrain them into your daily life, it just makes the world a difference, but you can hear it, but you have to actually do the thing. Yeah, absolutely. And like, it doesn't have to be forever. I know I was one of those moms. I like, I can't meditate. I'm too busy. My mind won't settle down, but it's a practice. It's like, it sounds so cliche, but like learning to ride a bike, you don't get it overnight. You need to practice. But once you figure it out, you can always go back to it. The thing about meditation is the idea of doing it isn't always fun, but once you do it, you feel so much better. It's kind of like a workout. You don't want to go to the gym, but once you're done, you're like, I feel amazing. And when you can train yourself to do it, whether it's for 10 minutes, whether you're doing it for half an hour, I try to do it for an hour in the mornings. If I can get up at 6am before my kids get up and it's an incredible way to start your day because you're like, I feel so connected to myself and I'll be a better mom, better wife because of it. Yes. I love it. A lot of people will say that meditation, I don't have time for it. And I'm like, but you have time to scroll through social. You have time to binge watch your favorite show, listen to your favorite podcast. So what if you just decide to make it a priority? What if you just decide to give yourself even that 10 minutes to start with and build yourself up to that hour? Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. It's definitely like, it's a habit that has to be made. The thing with scrolling is it's mindless. You don't have to be present. You're just like, you're in a trance is what you are. You're just like, it's like driving and you're like, oh yeah, how did I get here? You just got singing to the music or thinking about something. You're just in this trance like state where you're not present. So that's easy, right? Because you don't have to be, you don't have to be present. And so when you're meditating, you actually have to sit and feel all those emotions you've been stuffing down. And it can be quite intimidating with the women I work with at first. They're like, oh, I don't know if I want to go there. This is hard. But once you start ripping off those first few band-aids and you really start to release a lot of those emotions that you like, I didn't even realize that was there. I thought I was over it. Once those start to go, then it gets so much easier and you almost get addicted to it. You're like, what's next? I can't wait to feel better. Absolutely. You do. You get addicted to it because you get to the addicted to that good feeling and giving your mind a rest that you can drop into your heart, drop into your belly, your intuition, the goodness that's inside of you. I love that we're speaking on this because it's a tool that I highly, highly encourage all my listeners and clients and myself personally to do because it works and it's, it's magic. Yeah, it is. We can heal ourselves. We truly can heal ourselves. Absolutely. Like we have everything we need is within us and it's Mm. might sound like so bizarre, but it's 100% anything you desire. If you want that, you can have Mm. it. It's all based on like your mindset or just releasing those blocks within you, those beliefs that are keeping you stuck. Like I don't have enough money. I can't have a job like that. I'll never have a relationship like that. How can I be a mom who does all this, this, and this? 
if it's something you really want, we just got to get those blocks out of the way, which are often these beliefs that are holding us back. And that is the best self-care, in my opinion. That's the best work I've ever done is the work to deprogram, to (laughs) dehypnotize, because you were talking about that's what you do. So basically taking that, all of those programming, all those layers of the things that I put on myself and just removing them. And I think that's the best thing we can do is invest in our self-care. Self-care, yes, could be a bubble bath, but like you're saying, removing those blocks just gives you life. Yeah, it's so true. It doesn't just help you. Like that's what I accidentally stumbled across was when I did my inner work, Mm -hmm. everything got better in my life. And the first one I really noticed was my marriage. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say women can save their marriage on their own. Even if your partner doesn't want to go to counseling or they're like, you know what, everything's fine. Or, you know what, it's okay. This is just how the marriages are supposed to be. We're supposed to like fight here or there, or we're not always going to get along. If you want a marriage where you get along, you can have that marriage. And it starts with you. You don't have to go to counseling. And I often recommend if you're going to go to couples counseling, you do your inner work each on your own, or at least one of you is because marriage counseling is great. Depending on the counselor, it can sometimes re-traumatize because you're just bringing up past stuff and trying to work through it when we're not actually getting to the root issue that's down below, which is often from your childhood. And I call your inner child and that little child from when you're a kid who didn't maybe feel as loved because they didn't get recognition for, you know, what just being a cute kid who was funny. Instead, they only got recognition for, did you get good grades? Thank you for emptying the dishwasher. They got that kind of praise, not just like maybe cuddles on the couch, just saying, I just love you. Mm -hmm. And because they didn't get that part of them doesn't feel loved. And now they're in a marriage and they want their partner to love them when they don't necessarily Mm -hmm. even love themselves or know how to love themselves. So we can go back and just kind of heal and reprogram some of that stuff from your past. And that's what I do with my meditations and my hypnosis you can do that, then you show up differently in your marriage because you're not expecting so much from your partner because you love yourself and you can see your partner for who they are. They are doing the best they can with what they know how. Yes. So good. It's so true. And I am going to raise my hand and say, I kept wishing my husband would change. I kept saying, if you do this, I'll be happy. If you do this, I will, everything will work. If you just stop drinking, that was our biggest thing. If you just stop drinking, everything will be fixed. Like just stop drinking. Okay, we did that. We played that game for probably 10, 11 years. And then I just decided to start working on myself and doing this inner child work. My husband is a year sober now, which I don't want to say that I did that. But by me doing my work and me being so filled up and loving to myself, I was so much more able to love and be compassionate towards what he was going through. I was able to hold that space for him to heal in a whole new level. And that was just because I did, I chose to do that work on myself and that ripple effect. It's mind blowing what happens when you decide to do the work on yourself. Oh, I'm glad you said the ripple effect, because that's what so many women say. They're like, how can I do this on my own? Or like, my husband's not going to do any of this work. No, exactly what you just said. That's an incredible testimonial to Mm -hmm. this work. When you do the work, all of a sudden you don't, you don't nag the same. You don't judge the Mm -hmm. same. You come from such a loving place. Everything you say is loving. And I'm not going to say it's going to transform overnight in regards to how your partner reacts. Sometimes that actually kind of goes backwards for a bit because your partner's like, you think you're better than me. And they're so used to arguing with you that all of a sudden those aren't happening and they they always get their back up. But once you kind of get through that little hump, which doesn't last too long, all of a sudden they feel more open. Mm -hmm. They can communicate with you. They don't feel judged. They feel like your house is a safer space Mm -hmm. and you start to laugh again. You start to connect again. And when you do have any kind of like feedback or suggestions, they don't take it as criticism the same way. And I always call it like law of vibration here. Like you're vibrating at a higher level because you feel so good that they just naturally come up with you. And the odd time, if they don't come up with you, then that's great clarity for you. You're like, you know what? This is time to exit the marriage. And that happens the odd time too. But most often your husband will rise up with you. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's so true. There was a point in my healing journey that my husband was just like, you're always changing every week. It's like, it's something new. You're always changing. And I kept saying, like, at first he was looking at it as a bad thing because he got married to this woman and this is who I was. And now I'm just evolving and they just keep growing and you see the changes they happen. I know it takes time, but once you get that one belief and you just keep working on those beliefs, it goes pretty quickly from my work on my personal self and some of my clients. And what I found was I had to actually say to him, like, meet me up here. Like I am living at a higher frequency. I am rising up. I am leveling up and I invite you to do the same. And by me giving him that invitation, it was almost like permission to do the same. 
And so I love what you're speaking to because it's truth. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a beautiful process when you can get there. It all starts with you. It starts with recognizing those triggers and the triggers, what emotions are coming up, getting super curious. What do those emotions mean? And like the beliefs are endless. Like, is it that I'm too old? I'm not smart enough. I don't look pretty. I'm not good enough. I'm not loved. I'm stupid. I'm fat. Like it's just whatever these beliefs are. And you might say rationally, like, I know I'm not stupid, but maybe it was back in like grade three, a a kid asked you a question. You didn't know the answer to it. They're like, what is 10 times 10? And you accidentally said 90 or something. And uh, maybe the class laughed at you. And because of that, you felt really stupid. And that imprinted in your mind. We have a thing called the amygdala back of our brain. And what happens is it like imprints your emotions. So the memory has these emotions associated, not necessarily all the visuals, but you will like, sometimes if you hear a song, like the sound will bring up a memory. That's because that stuff is stored in your mind. So our senses will bring back these memories, which then bring up these beliefs. You always have a memory with that memory. You have a belief about it. Was I a good person? Was I a bad person? And then from there, it creates an emotion that goes along with it. Like, oh, I was stupid. And I feel really bad about myself because Mm -hmm. that memory of when I got that question wrong. So the memory creates the emotion, creates the belief I'm stupid, creates the emotion of like not feeling good enough, which then creates a habit, which is, you know what, I'm not going to share my opinion with anyone because they might think I'm stupid. And that's what happens in our marriages. All of a sudden these habits that were formed because of incidences in our childhood, these habits play out where you might not share your true opinion with your partner because you don't want them to laugh at you because they might think you're stupid. It's just, it's incredible how our childhood still plays out in our marriages. And that's why these triggers are massive clues into inner work that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's so true. It's so, so true that we have our memories from the past that is stopping us because then that emotion, because whenever we have an emotion, it just stores it into our brains and makes it feel so permanent, makes it feel like, I love the analogy or the, what somebody has said that has stuck with me is like September 11th is, was a crazy moment in time. And it was such a big moment that, that you can remember exactly where you were, what you were doing, because that was such a big emotion. So for me, when you're saying that it's so true, when you have those big emotions, even if they're not as big as September 11th, which was huge, they're still stored in our body, even if we can't remember them. That's what I'm hearing from what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. We store, like our mind is made up of two minds. We have our conscious mind and we have our subconscious Mm -hmm. mind. We operate primarily out of our conscious mind, which is only 5% of our brain power, which is crazy because that's where we spend most of our day. Our subconscious mind, where we store those memories, every memory, even if it's calculus from high school, it's all those history dates from high school. They're there. We just don't use them because our brain is super efficient and it does something called pruning. So it only keeps the information like, easily ready to grab, but all that other stuff's still there. All our memories are in there. We're just not aware of it. But the thing is, it's like our subconscious mind is this like computer program. So it's operating our body. We just don't realize that subconsciously we are acting from this programming in our mind that was actually formed in childhood. So the subconscious mind actually drives so many of our words and behaviors. We have 60,000 thoughts a day. How many of those thoughts do you think you're actually aware of? Not many. And that's those thoughts are just because of your subconscious mind and those memories from your childhood, which then form these beliefs about yourself that you're not good enough, which then create an emotion of feeling really Mm -hmm. bad about yourself, which then create the habits that wreak havoc on your marriage with, or on your relationship with your kids or your low self-esteem. Yeah. And if you can fix that, why not? You have the power to fix that. I love that. I love that you keep saying it starts with you. You have the power to fix it and it's a decision away decide, decide, that's what I'm going to do. And for me, it had to get bad. And I had to be pregnant with my son in order to be like, this is not going to (laughs) work. This needs to change. I had to get lit up. I had to get fired up. I had to pump myself up to get myself to even move and decide Mm -hmm. to make that decision to change. And why do you think that is that we have to get so like fed up? We have to get so done. I know. You know what? It's you're, you're right. Like most people don't just start this work because, oh, you know what? I'd like, I'm curious. Like if you're feeling good, you're like, I'm good. But when things don't feel right and you get sick of it, so often that's when it starts. It's usually with that major health crisis. It's like a huge financial loss. It's a death. It's a tragedy. It's major marriage issues. That's what usually sparks the inner work because you're like, I don't want to feel this way anymore. But I would encourage anyone to start getting curious. If you're like, even day to day, if you're like, you know what? I feel a bit angry or I feel resentful 
get on it now. And then you don't have to get to a place because it's just going to keep building all those emotions. But yeah, I think when I look back, mine probably started with the pregnancy of my second son, feeling super overwhelmed. Uh, a couple of years later, my father-in-law passed away and I felt completely lost. And then another couple of years, it was my brain bleeding. I think it was my body throughout that process, yelling at me, being like, Beth, listen to me. You're not good right now. You're, you're, you're not operating the way you're supposed to. Would you just listen and slow down and stop? but it took me to be in the hospital without not able to walk for a month to learn that lesson. So yeah, if you can get there before then, I would encourage that. That would be a good idea. Yes, that would be a brilliant, brilliant idea. And it's the best work you will ever do. It's the best work you will ever do. And the thought in my mind right now is that ripple effect. It changes your marriage and it changes your relationship with your children. And I would love to talk a little bit about that, how you use this with your children, how this okay. work shows up for you. Cause for me, I know it's been huge life giving, especially with my first. <laughs> yeah. We use it every day. I'm always telling them if they're angry at each other, cause the three boys, they they're great, but they're loud. And they'll tell you if they're mad at each other, they'll push. And we're trying to do hands off and be loving, but it's in them. They want to be hands-on at times. So it's really like, those are your emotions. He didn't make like your younger brother didn't make you feel that way you are upset about something. And so we'll talk about that. They know that their emotions are their emotions. They know if I get mad at them, they're like, mom, you're, they'll say this, you are projecting your anger onto me. Like just see my computer, like the battery died. And all of a sudden I couldn't send that last email. I'll be like all kind of huffy puffy. And then they're really getting like, I'm trying to think if they can't find their shoes, cause I left them outside in the rain on the trampoline, I'll get mad at them. And they're like, mom, you're projecting your anger onto me. And you're like, you're right. It's not about the shoes that are stuck in the rain. It's about me and my computer. So they, they can pinpoint it too. And I love that they know that others project their anger onto them, but they're not going to take it on. My middle son's super sensitive and he does take it on. So I have to be very conscious of that and aware of how to parent him versus the other two and talk to him more about those feelings that he's feeling. Like if he feels like others are mad at him. Where does he feel that in his body? Kind of like we started off, like he, if he can't name it, where do you feel it in your body? Like my son had trouble going to school this morning, my six-year-old, he was just felt scared. He finally opened up and he put a word to it. He's like, I feel scared. I'm like, where do you feel it in your body? And he actually put his hand on his chest. And I was like, that's amazing. I couldn't get him much further than that, but he recognized it. And I think that's really powerful. It's so powerful. It's huge. It's life-giving because when I was a child, there was no talking about emotions. It was like, put it down, be happy now, basically. And I think putting it, like getting your kids to talk about their emotions and just even talking about the emotions, I think is huge. But then that step further, like you're projecting your anger onto me, mom. Wow. That is what every mom wants. That's the dream. So how do you get there? Yeah, we've talked about emotions even before I really started this work with my my son who's 10. We've always talked about emotions. I'm always like, how do you feel? I always say like, how does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? So my kids can name emotions, but if your kids can't just say, how does that make you feel on the inside? Does it make you feel small? Does it make you feel like your shoulders need to shrug in? Just use really descriptive words. Does your heart feel heavy? Sometimes I ask them, what color is that in your body? And they'll name it. They're like, that's, I feel black in my body right now, or I feel yellow in my body. Like ask them just to describe it. Yeah, it's huge. I love what you are saying because it speaks to my soul because when I was a kid, I couldn't name my emotions. I didn't know what I was feeling. So as I've done this work, it's the same thing. Sometimes it's so hard for me to name the emotion that I'm feeling. I just know I don't feel good. I just know I feel heavy. I just know I want to hide. Right. And so asking your child, like what color is it? How does it make you feel on the inside? Brilliant question. Yeah. Another good piece too is letting them feel. I think as moms, we want to fix it. We want to be like, what can we do to make this better? Give them that space just to be in a grouchy mood. Be like, what is it that you need right now? That's another great question. Or how can I help? Or can I just sit with you? Do you want me just to rub your back instead of constantly trying to talk them? Because when we're in a bad mood, do you want to talk about it? No. Sometimes you just want to sit in it and let yourself process it. So getting to know your kids and what do they actually need when they're upset? But often as moms, we don't have time for that. We're like, you know, we got things to do. I don't have time for this bad mood. Suck it up. Let's go. And we won't necessarily say suck it up. Let's go. But we're like, just ignore it. It's really important to see them, see them and hear them and just 
say, I understand you're having a tough time right now. Is it okay that we keep doing this? Or do you really need to sit here? And we'll, if so, you know what, whatever it is needs to wait and we will take care of you because they're your priority. Yes, absolutely. That's so true. It's so true. When I ask myself, what's the most important thing in this moment that shifts everything for me? Like my mind can be wanting to run a million miles an hour with that to-do list. That's never ending. But when you're aware enough to even ask that question, like what's most important and knowing that that's the priority for you, that makes a huge difference. And giving your kid that space to feel their feelings, that is so huge. But I think as moms, not all moms, but some moms, it's so hard for us to process our feelings. So it becomes so hard. So it goes back to doing your own work is what it's going through me right now is you have to do your own work to be able to even recognize that you have to be able to sit in it sometimes. Yeah. I'll add this too. Like your closest relationships are your greatest teachers. Mm -hmm. So my husband, my kids, my own parents, and when you feel triggered by them, it's often like if you feel a certain way, it's because they are mirroring to you what you need to work on. If you feel like your husband's judging you, it probably means you're judging yourself. Like mm. to say I was, when I was training for my runs, I was doing half marathons. If I was doing my long two hour run, if I was like, Hey, Neil, my husband, is it okay if I go out? And if he wasn't super excited, but he's like, yeah, I guess so. All of a sudden I feel guilty being like, mm. Oh, maybe I should stay. It's because I'm judging myself. I feel guilty. He just said, sure. It's okay. But I didn't like his reaction. I read into it, but really it's me. I'm feeling guilty for leaving my kids for two hours. So it's really important that your kids are your greatest gifts too. Like if you're feeling like you want to fix it, like if they're being bullied at school, you're feeling really angry. It might be because you were bullied and it's actually bringing up some of those emotions that are stored within you from your past. So it's really important to figure out how do I feel that my kids are acting this way? Do I feel embarrassment that they're having a meltdown in the middle of the grocery store? And why is that? Because I have a belief that kids are supposed to act a certain way. And I was raised like not to have a tantrum on the floor you know what? Kids have tantrums. It just means their needs aren't being met and they're probably exhausted. And you know, it's okay. And everyone else around you is probably like, they've been there too, but you all of a sudden feel the shame and embarrassment that your kids aren't acting very well. So it's so important that we realize all the emotions that come up, even with our kids, because they're that, that experience is going to teach you something about yourself, a belief that you have that's not in alignment really with what you want to feel. Yes. Oh my gosh. That is so true. That is so true. What are you basically making that belief mean? The situation that you in, what are you making it mean to yourself? And yeah, then in exactly. turn, then you're able to speak about it, be about it in a whole different way. I love this conversation so much. I love that we're talking about the brain and the mind and breaking it down in a way that is so beneficial and useful and bite sizes and people can actually take these questions and these exercises and use it and do the work, but also they can work with you as well. And where can they go to support you, cheer you on, work with you and all that fun stuff. I would love for you to speak on that. Amazing. I hang out on many of the social media platforms. My favorite one is Instagram. So check me out on Instagram. I have this great guide for anyone who's got a great marriage, but maybe it's not so great. It'll some great tips. It's called three ways to save a marriage, www.freemarriageguide.com. Check it out. It's very much this kind of energetic way of transforming you transform your marriage. Mm -hmm. And I give three great tips there that will get you started on this, on this journey. Yes. And that is huge. And you also have a podcast. No, I don't have a podcast. I have I go on Instagram live a lot. So I do oh, a lot yes, of interviews yes, there. Yes, yes. You, that's where I've seen you, your Instagram lives. So do you want to share your Instagram handle? with us? Oh, yes. It's at Solify Wellness. So Solify Soul and then IFY, kind of like Spotify, all one word, Solify <laughs> I Wellness. It. I love it. Beth, this conversation has been so great. I felt the truth of it. I felt the tingles in my spine. So I know that this message is going to touch hearts. So thank you so much for being you and sharing with such an open heart. I also would love for you to share based on this conversation we've had any last thoughts that are on your heart that you feel called to share with the listeners of make life fun. The mama that is out there that is thinking, Oh my gosh, they're speaking to me. And I don't want to wait until I hit rock bottom to do this work. I want to do this work. And yeah. What's that on your heart to share? <laughs> yeah. I have probably three quick little tips. Yes. My first one would be your intuition should guide you. And we often squash our intuition, but anytime you hear something, if it's simple as, you know what, you're thinking of a friend, text them, just mm -hmm. stop for a moment, just send them a quick message. Hey, I'm thinking of you. Or if you're like, maybe I shouldn't eat that. You know what? Go with that. Don't eat it. Just listen to your body. 
and just hear these little messages and they don't come through as, Hey, call your friend. It might just be a thought of them, like a glimpse of them. And that's the universe, God, whoever that you believe in telling you, you know what, there's something there. And then follow those little intuitive hits. So like little breadcrumbs in life, and they'll lead you to exactly where you need to be. It doesn't always lead you to like, they might lead you to challenges or obstacles, but they're there for you to learn and grow. So that would be one of my biggest tips that and just trusting and surrendering to what has to happen. If you're listening to your intuition, mm-hmm. just trust and surrender that you're co-creating with something bigger than you, that exactly what you need will come. And when you can do that, you can feel so much more present and you get rid of all that fear and that worry of what's going to happen. I don't know if this is, this is going to work out the way I want to, but trust and surrender that you're always exactly where you need to be. Mm-hmm. Oh, beautiful. I love those tips. And I love the talk on the intuition of listening to that and feeling those little nudges and letting that be your guide. It's beautiful. Beth, thank you so much. Oh, this has been great. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Make Life Fun Show. I hope you enjoyed yourself and got a little, little gems, little pieces of gold that you are taking to heart, that you are not just listening, but you're going to do something about it. I want you to be fired up. So yes, so we come once a week, come back, listen to us here. We are on all podcast places you listen. We are also on YouTube if you like to watch the show at Josie Wheatman. You can find us at Make Life Fun. And I am so stoked. And also come follow me, come play with me on Instagram at Josie Wheatman. I am dancing. I am showing my sweet baby. (laughs) And we're just having a ball. We're making life fun. And so come hang out with us. And thank you again for listening. Please subscribe to the show. Follow us. Leave us a review because the more you love up on me, other people can find the show and love up on us. And we build this community that is one of love and goodness. Also, I am taking clients. I'm taking one-on-one coaching clients. Like I said, we're talking about Bloom. We have a membership coming up and all the beautiful things. So there is a few ways that you can connect with me on that. So we have my website, which is backrosecoaching.com. You can go on there as well as you can join the mail list. So right now I have a 21 day raise your vibration challenge going on. It's an email challenge completely offhand. You wake up every day and you get these tidbits of goodness that light you up. So why not? It's a 21 day high vibration challenge. It's tools. It's simple. It doesn't require much. Most of them, if you want a little taste, is placing your hand on your heart and telling yourself you love yourself today. So yes, so come hang out with me. Jump into my world. I've got you.